today is a great day. And the reason today is a great day is because today you're going to get the explanation for something that should have been bothering you for a long time. And that something is this. In 351, you learned that molecules with pi bonds in them are reactive as nucleophiles. And you learned, let's see, yes, we are recording. You learned, say, that if you added uh, bromine to this molecule, uh, that you would go through a bromonium ion and you would eventually get an addition product that looks like this, in which carbons A and B each get a new carbon bromine bond. If that doesn't look familiar to you, uh, that's, that's from 351. Uh, but you may have noticed that we never did that with benzene, even though there are three double bonds in benzene. And in fact, you can put benzene together with bromine and nothing happens. Uh, and in fact, over time, you probably learn to basically ignore benzene in reactions. And when you've asked why doesn't something happen to double bond in benzene, my explanation to you is probably, well, benzene's especially stable for reasons we will discuss. About to trip over stuff. Well, that happy day is here. Today we are going to discuss the, yay, that reason, yeah. So, um, so it turns out that you can, and, and this is chapter, yeah, 19. I am recording, yep. Yeah. We've all got it on tape. So it turns out you can get something to happen with benzene, but, but from this you infer that benzene is not as nucleophilic as an isolated alkene. And the reason for that has to do with resonance and conjugation and something else related. It turns out that uh, one hypothesis for what you could do if you wanted to get benzene to react, I told you it's not that good of a nucleophile relative to the alkene. So one strategy might be let's make bromine even more electrophilic. So one strategy to do that is to include uh, a, a Lewis acid catalyst. We're going to learn about this in chapter 20. So don't worry about it now, but it soups up bromine and makes it even more electrophilic. And that will actually succeed in getting benzene to react. But interestingly, the product is not the same as it was for the bromine reaction with an alkene. In the bromine reaction with an alkene, you get an addition product. However, for this reaction with benzene, you don't get an addition product, you get a substitution product. And magically, the double bond on the benzene ring is still in place. So that tells you that there's something really unique about benzene and those three double bonds in the benzene ring that we need to talk about. Uh, and that uniqueness is called aromaticity. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. Before we do, I just want to point out some things that you basically should already know about benzene. And that is that benzene does not consist of alternating single and double bonds. This is not um, 2, 4, 6 cyclohexatriene. Uh, because you can draw a resonance structure where the pi bonds are between 1 and 2, 3 and 4, and 5 and 6, just as easily as you can draw the resonance structure where they're between 2 and 3, 4 and 5, and 1 and 6. And in fact, the actual structure of benzene has probably partial double bond character at each of these positions. I don't like to draw hybrid structures because it's easy to lose track. Of, how, of where the electrons are. 
sometimes people will draw benzene like this, particularly in biochemistry textbooks. Uh, the circle there just means each double bond, each of those bonds, the six bonds in benzene has partial double bond character. If you go look at bond lengths in benzene, they are intermediate. They are all the same, they're identical. Each of the bonds between carbons one and two, two and three, three and four, and so on, are all the same length. They are intermediate between a double bond, which is shorter, and a single bond, which is longer, okay? So all of this points to the fact that resonance and conjugation is really important for the structure of benzene. When you look at it, though, I prefer to draw benzene like this, but you need to see something like this in your mind. In other words, that all of the carbons in benzene are identical, all the carbon-carbon bonds are the same length. The other thing you need to see looking at that is that all of the carbons are sp2 hybridized and that benzene is planar. All of that should basically be review, but does that sort of make sense? Okay, molecules like benzene have a special stability which we call aromaticity. And um, molecules that possess this property or special stability are called aromatic. Now that name came from the fact that molecules like benzene used to have or were thought to have a characteristic odor or aroma, but now we no longer use the word to refer to the properties of, of how they smell, but the, but, but the specific stability that these molecules have that's related to the resonance stabilization. So uh, we're gonna classify some molecules like benzene as being aromatic, which means the following criteria. Okay, first, they have to be cyclic, okay? If it's linear, it can't be aromatic. That's a simple yes, no decision. Second, they have to be what we're going to call fully conjugated. Now there's a lot of different ways to formulate what we mean by fully conjugated, but here are at least some of the requirements. Each atom, has a p orbital on it and all of the p orbitals are um, aligned parallel to each other. Let's, let's examine how that's true in benzene, right? In benzene, each of the atoms in benzene, one through six, is sp2 hybridized. You can tell that's the case because each of them is surrounded by three groups. You expect the sp2 orbitals on each carbon to be involved in the sigma bonds. Therefore, what's left over on each atom of the benzene ring is a p orbital. Now we're looking down at this benzene ring from above we see on each carbon one of the lobes of the p orbital above the plane of the page and another lobe below the plane of the page. These are each the individual atomic orbitals, S, uh, p orbitals that are on each of the sp2 hybridized carbons of benzene. I'm using color to highlight wave function sign. You're probably used to seeing this before. The p orbital has a switch in wave function sign at the carbon nucleus. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the sign of the wave function is plus or minus, only that there's two options available. But you can see how each of these p orbitals is aligned parallel to the others. I'm not going to draw the side view, but you can sort of put your eye in the plane of the page and look towards that and imagine, okay, fine. <sighs> That's my frustrated parent sigh. I've been working on that at home. Um, by the way, I need your help with something. Um, last night, my son Adam went to the Mountain View Bruins football game at the Bruin Bowl in Orem, Utah, and uh, they lost, by the way, but uh, <laughs> we texted him to see when he was gonna come home, and he said, not now. Risen. 
and I think it was spelled this. Adam is 13. So uh, the, the etymology of risen is, is from charisma. Is that right? Okay, if you have riz. But I don't think that means you give a really engaging lecture. That means flirting? Is that fully equivalent? Are there any meanings I'm missing? Can I fully equivalent? That's pretty much it. Okay. All right. I'm good. All right. Okay. Okay. That, that was helpful. In any case, <clears throat> that has nothing to do with aromaticity. This is going live. I wonder whether I need to edit that out to protect the innocent. No? Okay. All right, whatever. For, forever we'll have record of my 13-year-old son risen at the Mountain View football game. So. All right. Well, uh, so you can see that in benzene, each of the atoms is, uh, each of the p orbitals is, is lined up with the other. What we mean by this is, and this is how Dr. Paul Savage, my, my colleague, explained this to me in 2000 when I took the class from him. Uh, or was it 2001? I can no longer remember. This is a contiguous array of p orbitals on adjacent atoms, okay? So that's, it's gotta have that. Now, one of the consequences of this, having a contiguous array of parallel uh, p orbitals or aligned p orbitals is, and your text presents this as sort of a separate criteria, but molecules that have a contiguous array of parallel p orbitals will be this way. It needs to be planar, okay? So uh, you can call this criterion planar separate from fully conjugated, but in practice they go together uh, with the other criteria as well. There are organic, and we'll, well, I'll say more about that later. Um, finally, the final criterion for aromaticity is it has to have the right number of electrons. What do, we, what do we mean by that? Well, molecules, we have observed that molecules that enjoy this special stability have a number of electrons involved in what I'm going to call the pi system. By that, the pi system, I mean the, the, basically the number of electrons that are involved in conjugation and resonance. For benzene, it would be six, right? So the right number of electrons, we've just observed that it follows a pattern, two, six, 10, 14, 18, et cetera, molecules that are cyclic, fully conjugated, planar, and have these numbers of electrons involved in the pi system are aromatic. That follows a pattern which we describe as uh, in sort of mathematical series notation, 4n plus 2, where n is an integer from 0 to whatever. Uh, some people get confused by this. n does not refer to the number of atoms in the ring. It's just an, an integer. And those electrons, 2, 6, 10, 14, are the allowed number of electrons in a ring that is aromatic. Okay, so you gotta meet all those criteria to be aromatic and enjoy special stability. We're gonna spend some time later today uh, talking about why all of these factors work to give a molecule special stability. But for now, you need practice on determining whether a molecule is aromatic or not. So we're gonna do that with increasingly difficult uh, sets of molecules. So. And actually, this lends itself really well to multiple choice questions. Is it aromatic or is it not? So, so preview, yeah. Benzene versus 1,3,5-hexatriene. Which is aromatic and which is not? Benzene is aromatic. <laughs> Why? 
Why is 135 hexatriene not aromatic? Not cyclic. not cyclic. Okay, that's easy. That's the easiest one you'll ever see. Is it on the test? No. Too easy. Boo. All right. How about this one versus this one? Gasp. Obviously, this one is not aromatic. Why is it not aromatic? You have to learn to see the protons that are implied but not shown. The lack of the double bond there tells you that this ring has two um, sp3 hybridized carbons. So this is not fully conjugated. If it's not cyclic or not fully conjugated, by the way, it is pointless to count the number of electrons. You only count the number of electrons if it's cyclic and fully conjugated. Yeah, there are two of you, so decide who's going to ask first. Um, so you said for the third, third uh, requirement for aromatic uh, rings, it is that you need to have the right number of electrons over five systems, and you put two as well. What's the instance in a cyclic instance that only needs two electrons? Ah. What is an example of a molecule that would be cyclic and only have two electrons? I am delighted that you asked. <laughs> this is called cyclopropenyl cation. And um, it sort of looks like one of the aliens from Toy Story. <laughs> the claw. <laughs> Who's in charge here? Um, it turns out that cyclopropenyl cation is cyclic, fully conjugated. Each of those atoms is sp2 hybridized with an unhybridized p orbital on it, and it has two electrons, which means it is aromatic. Now, here's a time we can talk about, I'm sorry, I feel the need to color. He needs to be wearing a blue, and his little hands can be green. Uh, here is a time we can talk about um, what aromaticity means and what special stability means. We don't mean that this is the most stable molecule in the world. We just mean that it is more stable than expected for a secondary carbocation and even more stable than expected for an allyl cation, which would be the acyclic version that's resonance stabilized. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the example I can think of with two electrons. Okay? Then, Matthew. Yeah, um, so you mentioned this um, regular p orbital. Does that include full p orbitals? Uh, can that, so in this example, we're thinking about an empty p orbital. Could it be full p orbitals? Yeah, we're going to start introducing some hetero atoms that will give examples of that. This is funny because the other guy that raised his hand is also named Matt. So you probably thought I was talking to you. Okay. Yeah. Right, so each of the atoms has to be sp2 and have a p orbital on it. We're not really going to worry at the start about whether those p orbitals have electrons in them or not. We're going to count the electrons later. In this case, in cyclopropenyl carbocation, you have two electrons in the pi bond, no electrons on this atom. Overall, two electrons in the conjugated pi system. And what we mean by aromaticity is that these two electrons, and you can see we could draw a resonance structure where the pi bond would be here or here, you conclude that those two electrons are actually delocalized across all three atoms of the ring. Remember, electron delocalization is stabilizing, so that's where 
this uh, stability from aromaticity comes from. Okay, uh, let's talk about some other kinds of molecules. Um, oh, actually, before we do that, I want to um, point out that under rule three, there is another category of something that we're going to call anti-aromaticity. I'm gonna explain this later, but anti-aromaticity is special instability. For molecules that check off rules one and two, but have a different number of electrons. Molecules that are anti-aromatic tend to have four, eight, 12, et cetera, number of electrons following the so-called 4n rule, where again, n is an integer using sort of mathematical series notation. So for aromatic systems, they're going to follow the 4n plus two rule. For anti-aromatic systems, they're gonna follow the 4n rule, okay? So this now allows us to make the following comparison. Benzene again, the sort of, yeah, all right, we're getting tired of it comparison. This is aromatic. Cyclobutadiene is anti-aromatic. Cyclobutadiene is anti-aromatic because it is cyclic. It is fully conjugated. And it has four electrons, which means it breaks the 4n plus 2 rule and it keeps the 4n rule, which means it's anti-aromatic, okay? What do we mean by that? Anti-aromatic means unusually unstable for, uh, in this case, for a similar molecule. So cyclobutadiene is way less stable than, say, the acyclic analog, which would be just 1,3-butadiene, okay? And one interesting feature, this is something that's alluded to in your text and is a, is a complicated sort of issue that we're gonna have to talk about. Molecules that, were, that are anti-aromatic will often distort their structures to avoid their special instability. So they will do things like twist or bend in order to prevent their p orbitals from being fully parallel <laughs> and aligned with each other. Uh, one of the things that cyclobutadiene does is it stretches out these sigma bonds, pulling the two pi bonds apart from each other. That tends to break up the conjugation and make cyclobutadiene uh, not quite as conjugated and not quite as bad as it would otherwise be. This is true for a lot of molecules that would be anti-aromatic. And your text deals with this in some confusing ways. Let me give you an example of that and then let me try to show you how I want you to answer these questions. Another example of an anti-aromatic molecule is cyclooctatetraene. So you need to draw a stop sign and then put four double bonds on alternating carbons. Cyclooctatetraene, I'm only calling it that so that I can say something other than that molecule right there. As we've drawn it, it is cyclic and it is fully conjugated, meaning you would expect an array of p orbitals on adjacent atoms all lined up with each other. It has how many electrons are involved in the pi system? Two, four, six, eight. That breaks the 4n plus two rule, but it keeps the 4n rule. Therefore, we would say that this molecule is anti-aromatic. Now that is a gruesome fate, and it makes this molecule highly reactive. To avoid that high energy arrangement, it turns out that cyclooctatetraene will distort its structure from planarity. So, oh, we went off the page there. 
Okay. We're going to distort structure from planarity, and now it's is in the wrong place. Whatever. Um, so for, for now, imagine that, um, hmm, how are we going to draw this? Imagine that this double bond here in this upper left-hand corner and this double bond here in the lower right-hand corner are going to stay in the plane of the page. But these two other arms here, this one and this one, are going to swing up out of the page. So we're going to create something that you, from something that used to be flat, we're going to create something that looks more like a boat. Here it is. Here are the two double bonds that are still in the plane of the page. Then the one arm swings up and the other arm swings up. Here are the green arms that swing up. And we get this sort of distorted boat shape. Yeah? Why does an odd number of pi bonds make it aromatic? Or, I mean, that's a, that's a true pattern. If we introduced lone pairs, it would be a little bit more confusing than that. So what you just said is not generalizable to molecules that have lone pairs that are conjugated. But it's, you're basically asking the same question. What's magic about 2, 6, 10, 14, and not magic about 4, 8, and 12? I will tell you that. There's, there's payoff at the end. I'm deliberately holding you back. Star Wars reference, Obi-Wan is holding me back. <laughs> Nobody? Yeah. Didn't really love all the Anakin complaining in Attack of the Clones, but go ahead. Could you do a chair? Uh, probably not. This is something like a boat, and you've heard of something like a boat before when we were talking about cyclohexane rings. Uh, this wouldn't form a chair because because. Uh, Chairs are, are for six-member rings containing sp3 hybridized <coughs> atoms, and this one doesn't. Yeah, but it is sort of boat-shaped. Yeah. Why is one of the green ends flipped down? Like it, down? it could have done the flipped down structure would look exactly the same. Oh, one up, one down. Sure, it could do that. I don't know which one is preferred. Actually, this is the one that's shown in your text. Uh, it would be interesting to compare the relative stabilities of those con conformations. Think about what the distortion in shape does, though, right? Uh, if the p orbitals of the double bond in front are here, notice that the p orbitals of one of the green double bonds are sort of perpendicular. Perpendicular orbitals, you may have learned this before, don't interact with each other. When orbitals are perpendicular or orthogonal to each other, there's no interaction. It has to do with the math and probably the dot product of two vectors, but um, in any case, what this does is by distorting from planarity, all of a sudden cyclooctatetraene is no longer planar, and it is therefore no longer fully conjugated, and so it can access a less destabilized state that's not really anti-aromatic anymore. Here's where the problem comes in, all right? Because your text will sometimes, and, and it, I've been talking to students who've taken the class previously and, and asking, oh, I did this problem, I thought it was anti-aromatic, but the text says not aromatic. Why is that? And I say, I agree with you, the molecule was anti-aromatic, it distorted its shape to be no longer uh, either aromatic and I'm, or anti-aromatic. Um, but to me, just calling it plain old not aromatic is a bad answer because it skips over the whole issue of to, as to why the molecule was unstable and had to change its shape in the first place. And that is because it would have been anti-aromatic. So when you see cyclooctatetraene in a problem, <laughs> the correct answer is anti-aromatic. Even though you know that to avoid the horrible fate of anti-aromaticity, it's probably going to distort its structure. You, you have to know why it needs to do that to begin with. So the right answer is anti-aromatic. Does that make sense? So you're going to encounter that on some practice problems. You need to pay attention though, and, th and this is something I wish your text would do differently, because the situation with cyclooctatetraene is clearly different 
from the situation, say, with cyclohexadiene, which is simply not aromatic, boring, because it's not fully conjugated. That's, that's an entirely different situation than for cyclooctatetraene, which, in reality, is no longer, no longer anti-aromatic or aromatic because it's distorted its structure to avoid anti-aromaticity. I wish your text was more explicit on that subject, um, but you're going to call it anti-aromatic. If something is cyclic, fully conjugated, and has the 4n number of electrons, the correct answer is anti-aromatic. Does that make sense? Okay. Of course, I'm happy to answer questions that are going to come up uh, as, as you work through problems. Now, uh, it gets more complicated, and we need to introduce molecules that have heteroatoms in them. So at some point in the past, I told you that one way to impress organic chemists is to be able to rattle off the names of heterocycles, that is, molecules that, have, uh, that are cyclic and have non-carbons or hydrogens in them. For example, this nitrogen. I told you that this one was called imidazole. So let's determine is imidazole aromatic or not. It's helpful when doing this to draw the, the correct number of lone pairs on each of the atoms, which I've done here. Now, you can see that imidazole happens to be cyclic. Uh, now we need to think about is it planar? To determine whether it's planar, it can be helpful to draw in all the hydrogens that are implied but not shown. Understand that when drawing structures in OCHEM, if there are hydrogens on heteroatoms, we must show the hydrogens. You can't omit hydrogens on nitrogen or on oxygen. So there legit is no hydrogen on this nitrogen. It's not implied. Okay. Um, now, are each of those atoms... Uh, sp2 hybridized is the molecule planar yes okay this nitrogen is surrounded by three groups and the lone pair is adjacent to a pi bond that is a classical situation for sp2 hybridization presumably the lone pair would be held in a p orbital how about this nitrogen also sp2 hybridized uh, what what kind of orbital is this lone pair in Hmm, you don't know. Some of you say P, some of you say SP2. It's one of those two. You better figure out which. <laughs> if the correct answer is yes, that lone pair is in an SP2 orbital. That lone pair is in a P orbital. That is a crucial distinction. If you don't get that right, you will get the answer as to whether this is aromatic or not wrong. So let's talk through it. Why is this lone pair in an sp2 orbital? How can you tell? Yes. Right. The p orbital is being used in the pi bond. The, mole the nitrogen is surrounded by three groups, so it has to be sp2 hybridized. But the p orbital is already taken up by the pi bond. Therefore, the only possible conclusion for what this lone pair is is that it is in an sp2 orbital. Understand what that means. This lone pair is in the plane of the page and it is orthogonal to or perpendicular to the pi system. Therefore, it is not involved in the pi system and we don't count it because aromaticity is about the electrons that can participate in resonance in the pi system and that lone pair cannot. Got it? What about the other lone pair? Why is that lone pair in a p orbital? That's actually the only place for it, right? The sigma bonds are all in the plane of the page. The sp2 orbitals uh, are all, take, all accounted for in the sigma bonds. The lone pair must be in a p orbital. Some of you, uh, depending on what you learn in 351, are going to look at that and say, hold on, I know better. It should be sp3 orbital, three, sp3 hybridized because that nitrogen is surrounded by four things, three atoms in a lone pair, and I learned that that meant it was sp3 hybridized. Good reasoning, bad application. Why? What makes that lone pair sp2, what makes that lone pair in a p orbital? Why is that nitrogen sp2 hybridized? 
to allow for the lone pair to be delocalized by resonance. It has to be in a p orbital so that it can participate in resonance. Okay, that's important. Again, if you, if you can't do that, you're going to get a number of questions wrong. An undisclosed number of questions wrong. Does that sound more <laughs> ominous? So with that, let us, let us highlight now the number of electrons. Uh, it's cyclic, it's planar, it's fully conjugated. Again, I'm going to erase the planar because what we really care about is, is it cyclic, is it fully conjugated, and does it have the right number of what I am now going to call pi electrons. What I mean by that is electrons that are participating in resonance and conjugation. We do not count the lone pairs in sp2 orbitals. We do count the lone pairs that are in, uh, S, uh, that are in p orbitals. So, two, four, six. There are six pi electrons here. And so that satisfies the 4n plus 2 rule. Therefore, imidazole is aromatic. Okay? Always. I'm not sure you've got this. So let's make it even worse. A molecule can be quite large, and when a molecule becomes quite large and we ask, is it aromatic or not, we are talking about a specific portion of the molecule. So this actually is the base from uh, DNA and RNA called adenine. I'm going to draw all of the lone pairs. And understand that when I ask aromatic or not, I am talking about this ring system, which, if you want to generalize, you will hear in biochemistry, rings of this general shape and, and where the nitrogens are all are called purines. Now, I'm going to give you a hint and tell you the answer, which is this is definitely aromatic. But I need you to justify why, and we got to determine which lone pairs count and which don't. We're going to do this atom by atom. So starting with this nitrogen, does the lone pair count or not? Yes. yes. Did you say yes because everyone else was saying yes? yes. Pretty much. Okay. Reason through it for me. The nitrogen is surrounded by three atoms and a lone pair, but the lone pair is adjacent to a pi bond. That signals to you that the lone pair is going to be in a p orbital so that it can participate in resonance. Therefore, the nitrogen is sp2 hybridized and the lone pair is in a p orbital. Yes, it will count. Okay? How about the lone pair on this nitrogen? No, no does not count. Good. Why? It's in an sp2 orbital. It has to be because the p orbital is already taken up by the double bond, right? Okay. Same thing with the other lone pairs. Let's look at this nitrogen. Does the lone pair count or not? No. no. If the nitrogen's already involved with a pi bond in the ring, the lone pair doesn't count. Same thing there. So let's count the number of electrons that are in the pi system. That's all of the lone, all of the lone pairs that are in p orbitals that are part of the pi system, and then all of the double bonds that are part of that conjugated system. So. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Adenine has 10 electrons in the pi system. That keeps the 4n plus 2 rule. Therefore, adenine is aromatic. Yeah? Right. Uh, lone pairs on a nitrogen would be sp3 if there were no pi bonds next to it. Classic example of that is the base, triethylamine. Lone pairs there are in an sp3 orbital. Yeah. Is that? Yes? What about the nitrogen up top? It is not part of the ring. It can participate in resonance. You would expect this nitrogen to be sp2 hybridized so that the lone pair could be in a p orbital so that it could participate in resonance. Does that resonance impact the aromaticity of the ring? No. Other hand, that's a stretch. Okay, that's okay. You're welcome to stretch. You don't have to. 
You don't have to, you don't have to be ashamed of stretching. Um, let's see. Yeah. So why do we not count this? Because it's not part of the ring. It is part of the pi system, but it is not part of the ring. So you count the number of electrons that are a part of the pi system in the ring. Do you need me to go back and amend? Yeah. So even though those, we'll call that an exocyclic amino group, meaning it's out of the ring, we only count the electrons that are within the ring. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> I know that's unsatisfying. I don't have a good ex explanation for it. There is one, and it has to do with the fact that this resonant structure is more stable because of its aromaticity than the resonant structures where this lone pair would be. And at most, this lone pair would be part of a double bond with the nitrogen here. Okay, I understand that's unsatisfying, but I think it's more efficient if we just accept it as a rule. We can talk more if you want a more detailed explanation. It may actually be beyond my level of understanding. Okay, uh, we need a little bit more practice. And so let's do this one. This one's always fun. Oxygen can have two lone pairs on it. It's always difficult to know which and how many lone pairs to count, okay? So let's reason through this. This oxygen is surrounded by two atoms and two lone pairs. You would normally think sp3 hybridized. However, one of the lone pairs is adjacent to a pi bond, so to take advantage of resonance, it makes sense that the, the oxygen would be sp2 hybridized, such that one of the lone pairs could be in a p orbital and the other could be in an sp2 orbital. There's really no way to make both of them be in p orbitals that align with the adjacent pi bonds, right? Sure, you could have both of them in a p orbital, but remember, p orbitals are all perpendicular to each other. So the one could be aligned with the pi system that the other couldn't. So on oxygens, a maximum of one of the lone pairs can count. Same thing down here with the other oxygen. One of them's in a p orbital, the other's in an sp2 orbital. It doesn't matter which, but the ones that are in the sp2 orbital can't count. Therefore, how many electrons are part of the pi system for this molecule? Eight. That's 4n, so this is anti-aromatic. Now, I will warn you, that is going to be the right answer for this molecule on my exam, though... If you see this in a practice problem, it is possible that your text is going to tell you not aromatic. Your text is going to say that presumably because uh, this molecule distorts its structure to avoid being perfectly planar and conjugated to there, thereby avoid the gruesome fate of anti-aromaticity. Okay, so you're going to need to practice that. Um, you're going to need to make mistakes and figure out why you make mistakes. I've tried to warn you, but like King Ben said, there's not enough time for me to tell you all the ways that you can make mistakes in this area. He was talking about these kinds of problems, by the way. <laughs> so uh, go make a ton of mistakes, figure out why, and fix them. Yeah, here he is. Can. Uh, can pi bonds, say, in a triple bond be part of an aromatic system? Yes, if the geometry works, but remember that the two pi bonds in a triple bond are perpendicular to each other like this, so only one of them can participate. The other can't. Yeah. All right, so on the other hand. Yeah. Right. One question is, why doesn't the oxygen do sp3? It probably does do that to avoid anti-aromaticity. But, but in order to see that, you need to anticipate that it would have been anti-aromatic. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now we need to talk. I'm, I'm still holding off a little bit on the why behind the 4n versus 4n plus 2 rule. 
We probably will have to do that next time, but I want to see how you can use aromaticity to rationalize important information. So important trends. So let me give you, you're going to love this. Here is a five-membered ring, and here is a seven-membered ring. This is one of my acquired OCHEM superpowers. I didn't used to be good at drawing seven-membered rings. Now I am. And they also look friendly. So pink proton, blue proton, less acidic. More acidic. I could provide actual pKa numbers, but I'm not gonna. I want you to use aromaticity to rationalize that. To do that, remember that an easy way to rationalize uh, acidity trends is to simply draw the conjugate base. So let's do that. Let's draw the conjugate base for the five-membered ring. That one looks kind of sad. I don't know. Uh, and then let's draw the seven-membered ring. Okay. Which one of those conjugate bases is more stable? Has to be because I told you that the conjugate acid was more acidic. Fine. Why is it more stable? Aromatic. What is the one on the right? Anti-aromatic. Both of them are cyclic, fully conjugated. The problem here is we've got eight electrons and that's a 4n rule. Here we have six electrons and that's a 4n plus 2 rule. So that satisfies cyclopentadienyl anion here is much more stable than this anion here. Okay, a related problem. I'm going to shrink this one down. This is a related problem. We'll have the same basic structure, only now we're going to be talking about SN1 rate. Remember, the SN1 reaction involves a leaving group leaving to give a carbocation. Slow fast. Rationalize why. Now remember when we explain SN1 reactions, the transition state leads to a high energy carbocation intermediate. Forming that carbocation is the rate determining step of the reaction. And by the Hammond postulate, that, that transition state is very uh, carbocation-like. So we can explain the rate of the reaction by considering the stability of the carbocation formed. Now I need to make that double bond on the bottom look a little happier. There we go. Why is the seven-membered ring carbocation more stable? How many pi electrons has it got? Six. Six electrons. That's a 4n plus 2 rule. That seven-member green cation is aromatic. The five-member green cation with four electrons is anti-aromatic. And that is why the seven-member green chloride reacts faster in the SN1 reaction because this intermediate is more stable because it's aromatic. Okay, got it? Now, when we meet next, we're going to take 10, maybe 12 minutes to talk about why the 6N, the 4N plus 2 rule works for aromaticity and the 4N rule works for anti-aromaticity. Between now and then, you need to work on these so you get them right every time. Okay? Go and do. I will see you on Monday.